October 30th, 2025. JetBlue Flight 1230 cruises at 35,000 feet. Passengers sip drinks, scroll their phones. Everything is perfectly normal. And then, without warning, the aircraft dove. Passengers slammed into the ceiling. Drinks, luggage, people, everything airborne. But here's what terrified investigators. The pilots hadn't touched the controls. In fact, the plane was in autopilot. 15 hospitalized, emergency landing in Tampa. For investigators, this incident is far too similar to the 737 MAX accidents. So the FAA immediately opens an investigation. But to their surprise, this wasn't a mechanical failure or pilot error or even a cyber attack. This was something aviation engineers had never prepared for, something that would ground 6,000 aircraft worldwide within a month. And the most disturbing part, the vulnerability had been hiding in plain sight for nearly a decade, millions of flights. This is the story of how a software glitch caused the biggest grounding in Airbus history. JetBlue Flight 1230. An Airbus A320 departed Cancun International Airport bound for Newark Liberty, carrying passengers looking forward to an ordinary afternoon flight back to the northeastern United States. As the aircraft settled into cruise altitude, the cabin took on that familiar rhythm of mid-flight normalcy. Flight attendants moved through the aisles with beverage carts. Passengers unbuckled their seatbelts, some stretching their legs in the aisles, others absorbed in their phones or e-readers. Everything appeared perfectly routine. And then, without any indication or warning whatsoever, the aircraft abruptly pitched downward. In an instant, the orderly cabin descended into chaos. Passengers experienced that sickening sensation of freefall, the stomach-dropping lurch that signals something has gone terribly wrong. Those standing in the aisles were violently thrown upward, some colliding with the overhead ceiling panels with enough force to crack the plastic compartments. One passenger later described the terrifying scene online, recounting how the drink service struck the ceiling alongside passengers and everything else not tied down, creating what felt like complete pandemonium. But despite the chaos, the oxygen masks remained stowed, which meant this wasn't a depressurization event. But for those terrifying seconds, passengers genuinely believed their aircraft was plummeting from the sky. In the cockpit, the pilots are stunned. According to subsequent technical analysis, the A320 experienced what aviation engineers call an uncommanded pitch-down event. Their instruments showed the autopilot was still engaged. They haven't touched the side sticks. Yet their aircraft had just executed an uncommanded nose-down maneuver, losing several hundred feet of altitude in seconds before the flight control system corrected itself. The captain immediately declares an emergency. Flight 1230 diverts to Tampa International Airport and lands without further incident approximately one hour later. From the ground, observers would have seen nothing unusual about the arrival. But inside that aircraft, the reality was far different. Passengers sat shaken and bruised, some bleeding from head wounds. And crucially, no one yet understood why a modern, sophisticated fly-by-wire Airbus had just attempted to dive on its own. As a result of this incident, approximately 15 passengers required immediate medical attention and were transported to area hospitals with non-life-threatening but significant injuries. JetBlue's response was immediate and appropriate. The airline pulled the aircraft from service, grounding it for a comprehensive technical inspection. Meanwhile, the Federal Aviation Administration opened a formal investigation, dispatching specialists to examine every aspect of the flight control system. At this early stage, most observers assumed they were looking at an isolated malfunction, frightening certainly, but perhaps just one faulty component on one particular airplane. But nobody involved in those initial hours could have anticipated that this single incident was about to trigger one of the largest emergency technical actions in commercial aviation history, affecting approximately 6,000 aircraft worldwide. But in order to understand what went wrong, we need to first examine what's actually controlling the A320 during flight. When the A320 entered service in 1988, it revolutionized commercial aviation by becoming the world's first production airliner to feature a full fly-by-wire flight control system. Unlike conventional aircraft, where pilots control inputs mechanically move cables and hydraulics to position control surfaces, fly-by-wire systems translate those inputs into electronic signals. 
When an A320 pilot moves the side stick, that physical movement doesn't directly manipulate the aircraft. Instead, these signals are processed by multiple computers that interpret the pilot's intent, cross-reference it against sensor data about the aircraft's current state, and then command hydraulic actuators to move the control surfaces accordingly. The computers serve as intermediaries, implementing the pilot's inputs while simultaneously applying programmed protections to prevent the aircraft from exceeding structural limits or performing dangerous maneuvers. Central to this system is the ELAC, the elevator and aileron computer. In fact, the A320 family employs two ELACs as part of its fault-tolerant design philosophy. These computers receive inputs from numerous sources. The pilot's side stick commands, sensor data including airspeed and aircraft altitude, and system parameters like structural load factors and flight envelope protections. The ELAC processes all this information and generates precise commands to move the elevators, which control pitch, and the ailerons, which control roll. In essence, the ELAC is one of the brains actually flying the airplane based on what the pilots want and what the aircraft's systems allow. As investigators began reconstructing what happened aboard JetBlue 1230, they focused their attention on this critical system. Early analysis of the flight data revealed something deeply concerning. ELAC-2, one of the redundant computer units, had issued a brief but unmistakable erroneous nose-down command, despite receiving no such instruction from the pilots. So the fundamental question became unavoidable. What caused ELAC-2 to generate that command? As engineering teams reconstructed the flight using recorded data and system logs, an unexpected pattern emerged. The incident occurred while Flight 1230 was cruising at high altitude, where atmospheric conditions differ significantly from those at lower elevations. At cruise altitude, typically between 30,000 and 40,000 feet, aircraft are exposed to substantially higher levels of solar radiation. And more crucially, space weather reports for late October 2025 indicated a period of intense solar activity, with powerful solar flares releasing enormous quantities of high-energy particles and bombarding the upper atmosphere with radiation far exceeding normal background levels. This created a problem that Airbus had never imagined and was not covered under the Airbus flight crew operating manual. So Airbus eventually issued a statement connecting these pieces. The analysis revealed that intense solar radiation had the potential to corrupt critical data within the ELAC system, data essential to the proper functioning of flight controls. In technical terms, the phenomenon is known as a bit flip and understanding it requires a brief detour into how computers store and process information. Digital computers represent all information as binary data, endless sequences of ones and zeros stored in memory cells. Each individual digit is called a bit, and even the most complex software ultimately reduces to patterns of bits. When a high energy particle from a solar flare or cosmic ray strikes a memory cell in a computer chip like ELAC, it can deposit enough energy to flip the state of a single bit. A zero becomes a one, or a one becomes a zero. For a brief period, the computer now believes something fundamentally incorrect about the aircraft's state or what it should be commanding. The system reacts based on this corrupted information, potentially generating uncommanded pitch down, pitch up, or roll inputs. In the case of JetBlue 1230, this bit flip manifested as a temporary nose-down command that caught everyone aboard completely unprepared. According to documentation later released by the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, the autopilot remained engaged throughout the event, and the overall altitude loss was classified as brief and limited. But even a limited brief departure from controlled flight proved sufficient to injure multiple unrestrained passengers severely enough to require hospitalization. A natural question emerges. If this vulnerability existed, why hadn't it been discovered during certification testing before these aircraft entered service? The answer reveals an uncomfortable gap in regulatory foresight. The specific ELAC software and hardware configuration involved in the Flight 1230 incident, identified in regulatory documents as ELAC BL104, had been installed on A320 family aircraft beginning around 2015. When that system was certified for operation, testing requirements did not mandate evaluation against extreme solar radiation scenarios capable of inducing bit flips in flight-critical software. This wasn't necessarily an oversight. 
In fact, this technology had accumulated millions of flight hours over nearly a decade without any documented incident matching this failure mode. Solar radiation-induced bit flips were understood as theoretically possible, but were considered extremely rare, so improbable that specific testing wasn't deemed necessary. However, once the JetBlue incident proved the vulnerability existed under real-world service conditions, that calculus changed instantly. Aviation authorities treat uncommanded flight control inputs from primary computers as potential structural hazards. If such an event occurred during a more critical phase of flight, like takeoff or landing, or under more extreme conditions like severe weather, the consequences could be catastrophic. By late November 2025, investigators had assembled sufficient evidence to act. So on Friday, November 28, 2025, exactly four weeks after Flight 1230's emergency landing, the full scope of the problem became public. Airbus transmitted an alert operator's transmission to every airline operating A320 family aircraft worldwide. Within hours, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency published an emergency airworthiness directive, essentially telling A320 operators that the affected aircraft could not return to service until the ELAC systems were either replaced or modified. The Federal Aviation Administration quickly followed with a parallel emergency directive covering approximately 545 United States registered aircraft. For the majority of affected aircraft, roughly 5,000 of the 6,000 requiring action, the solution was relatively straightforward. Maintenance crews would revert the ELAC software to the previous version, essentially rolling back the L104 update that had introduced the vulnerability. This software downgrade could be completed in approximately two hours per aircraft, assuming maintenance personnel were available. However, for about 900 to 1,000 older airframes, the fix proved considerably more complex. These aircraft required physical replacement of their ELAC computer hardware, a significantly more time-intensive procedure dependent on parts availability from the supply chain. The timing of the emergency directive created a perfect storm of operational disruption. The requirement arrived during the final days of November, coinciding with post-Thanksgiving travel in the United States. One of the busiest periods in the American aviation calendar, triggering cascading delays and cancellations that rippled through the entire domestic flight network. But surprisingly, according to Airbus, the vast majority of the aircraft affected by the safety alert have been modified, and they're back in service. However, the situation proved particularly devastating, especially for budget airlines operating older A320 variants requiring full hardware replacement, given the uncertainty about when replacement ELAC units would become available. These airlines typically depend on high aircraft utilization rates to remain profitable, and given the sudden grounding of portions of their fleets, especially aircraft requiring hardware replacement, could create an immediate financial crisis during the crucial Christmas travel season. But just when Airbus thought the A320's problem was solved, a new story has emerged. According to Airbus, it's facing an industrial quality issue with metal panels on some A320 family jets, severely affecting the quality of fuselage panels on several dozen aircraft, causing delays in some deliveries. While it's unclear whether these aircraft have already been delivered, the manufacturer called it a supplier quality issue, without naming the supplier in particular. But according to Miguel Salles, an Airbus union organizer, these quality control failures represent a systemic problem. He insists that warnings about declining standards have gone unheeded for years. In Sales' view, the workforce quality at Airbus has deteriorated significantly compared to a decade or two ago, a change he directly connects to the company's current manufacturing difficulties. This situation mirrors Boeing's own quality control crisis, where profit-driven decisions and production pressures led to catastrophic failures like the 737 MAX disasters. The aerospace duopoly has seemingly bred complacency, with both manufacturers prioritizing shareholder returns and delivery schedules over the rigorous quality standards that once defined them. When only two companies dominate the global market, competitive pressure to maintain excellence diminishes. The result is a troubling pattern, cost-cutting measures, weakened oversight, and a gradual erosion of the engineering-first culture that built these aerospace giants' reputations.